Antimatter, a central theme in contemporary physics, is essentially matter that contains the antiparticles of their ordinary matter counterparts. The key difference is that antimatter exhibits reverse charge, parity, and time, or the so-called CP reversal. Although antimatter only emerges in small quantities during cosmic ray collisions and certain types of radioactive decay, it has crucial applications in numerous easy-to-access technologies related to beta decay. From positron emission tomography to radiation therapy and industrial imaging, therapy and industrial imaging, artificially constructing antimatter is a fascinating yet Herculean task at particle accelerators. Despite yielding mere nanograms, these environments can yield antiparticles, which in theory share similar mass to their associated particle, yet have diametrically opposed electric charges and other quantum numbers. An encounter between a particle and its antiparticle counterpart culminates in a mind-blowing annihilation, creating an array of intense photons, neutrinos, and sometimes even other low-mass particle. Antiparticle duos this process, dependent on the presence of surrounding matter, can lead to the transmutation of annihilation energy into heat, light, etc. Further, valuable to remember is the famous mass-energy equivalence equation, Ihomek 2. This asserts that the amount of energy released during an annihilation is proportional to the total mass of the colliding particle and antiparticle and antiparticle. Antiparticles mutually interacting lay the foundations for antimatter, just as particles do for normal matter. Despite the intense effort, scientists have created complex artificial antinuclei, for instance, those of antihelium. Crucially, there's compelling evidence to support that the observable universe is dominated by ordinary matter rather than an evenly split between ordinary matter and antimatter. Understanding this discrepancy between matter-antimatter dominance remains a prominent unsolved riddle in the world of physics. It is theorized that baryogenesis is the process determining this imbalance. Interestingly, all antimatter particles carry the same charge as their corresponding matter particles, only in reverse. For instance, an antiproton manifests a negative charge while a positron, an anti-electron, carries a positive charge. When these particles collide, they transfer into energy and literature. This intriguing aspect of matter and antimatter has inspired science fiction terms such as CT from the French term contra, Turin. In 1928, the groundwork for understanding antimatter was laid by Paul Dirac. His revolutionary paper brought forward a relativistic version of the Schrodinger wave equation for electrons, hinting at the existence of anti-electrons. However, the full implication of his equation initially flew over Dirac's head. It was J. Robert Oppenheimer, who took his equation to fruition, arguing for the existence of positively charged electrons or positrons, in his enlightening paper on the theory of electrons and protons, released on 14th February 1930, the idea disputed Dirac's initial suggestion of it being a proton as positrons, being electrons' counterpart, should carry the same mass. This concept was finally proven in 1932 by Carl D. Anderson, who coined the term positrons from positive electron. While Dirac himself did not use the term antimatter, it naturally followed in the naming suite. Anti-electrons, antiprotons, antiprotons, and so on, even a complete periodic table of antimatter was proposed by Charles Janet in 1929. In the interpretation presented by Feynman, Stu Ekelberg, they speculated antimatter and antiparticles as regular particles traveling backward in time. The antiparticle is often denoted by a bar over the particle symbol with positive and negative electric charges used for distinction. For instance, an electron, E, and its counterpart, a positron, E way U, while P and P signify a proton and antiproton, respectively this interpretation also extends to quarks that constitute the protons. This further established the connection in the framework of antimatter, stating antimatter's anti-gravitational properties. They're currently under examination in CERN's Aegis and Alpha. G experiments. These studies aim to discern the possible gravitational interactions between matter and antimatter and between antimatter itself. This research, nevertheless, faces inherent challenges because of the catastrophic annihilation caused when the two types meet and the current complications in confining antimatter. Apart from the differing charges such as electric and baryon charges between particles and antiparticles, the theoretical implications suggest their properties are identical. This implies an antistar, 
a star composed of antimatter, would shine as brilliantly as an everyday star. This theory was put to test in 2016 in the Alpha experiment, studying the transition between the two least energy states of anti-hydrogen. The experiment mirrored the results to that of standard hydrogen, confirming the principles of quantum mechanics for antimatter. Moreover, on 27 September 2023, Physicists reported studies endorsing the behavior of antimatter particles analogous to normal matter in a gravitational field. This marked another significant milestone in our understanding of antimatter. Gamma rays observed by the European Space Agency's integral satellite hint at the origins of a large antimatter cloud enveloping the galactic center. These gamma rays, each carrying 511 keV of energy, suggest that the cloud, despite its skewed formation, aligns with the pattern of X-ray binaries near the galactic center. Although not entirely clear, it's plausible that the cloud results from the creation of electron. Positron pairs when ordinary matter falls into a stellar remnant, thereby gaining kinetic energy. Antimatter may be abundant in distant galaxies, a possible result of cosmic inflation in the universe's primordial era. Antimatter galaxies, despite having identical chemistry, absorption, and emission spectra, are difficult to identify solely through observational methods. NASA is actively seeking out these elusive galaxies. Their search guided by the X-ray and gamma ray signatures of potential annihilation events. The 2017 BASE experiment at Cannes reported an antiproton magnetic moment measurement to a precision of 1.5 parts per billion. This critical measurement aligns with the most precise reading of the proton magnetic moment supporting the CP symmetry hypothesis and marking the first time an antimatter property was determined more accurately than its matter counterpart. In 2018, antimatter quantum interferometry was first implemented at the Rafael Farragut's Positron Laboratory in Como, Italy. Beyond this experimental context, positrons, antiparticles of electrons, are naturally produced in radioactive isotopes and interactions of gamma rays with matter. In addition, in 2011, Researchers from the American Astronomical Society discovered antimatter, specifically positrons originating from above thunderstorm clouds. An environment adequate high temperature can also spur the production of antiparticles. Consequently, during baryogenesis, a period of extreme heat and density in the universe, matter and antimatter were supposedly in a state of constant production and annihilation leaving a surplus of matter this asymmetry between the matter and antimatter, referred to as baryon asymmetry, is a baryon asymmetry. Phenomenon currently under investigation, it's thought that black holes and neutron stars may contribute to this imbalance, generating sizable amounts of positron-electron plasma. The story revolves around the investigation of space weather cycles, specifically the ejection of matter by external shock waves and the creation of antimatter by reverse shock waves. The Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, AMS-2, currently operational on the International Space Station, has discovered that positrons and cosmic rays arrive without direction, with energies varying from 10 GeV to 250 GeV. A new study in 2014 also revealed that the fraction of positrons peaks at about 16 of total electrons and positron events, at an energy of approximately 275 at 32 GeV. However, above 500 GeV, however, above 500 GeV, the ratio of positrons to electrons begins to drop. The study suggested that this could be due to the production of positrons in the annihilation events of massive dark matter particles. Cosmic ray antiprotons possessing a higher energy than protons, their normal matter counterparts reaching Earth with a maximum energy of around 2 GeV, invoking a different production process than that of cosmic ray protons. The hunt for larger antimatter nuclei, like the antihelium nuclei, within cosmic rays is in progress. The detection of natural antihelium could suggest the existence of gigantic antimatter structures such as an anti-star. A model of the AMS-2, known as AMS-1, was sent into space aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery in 1998. There were a few signals consistent with the antihelium nuclei discovered by AMS-2, the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory stated that they had produced positrons in larger numbers than any previous synthetic process in November 2008. They used a laser that drove the electrons through a gold target's nuclei, which caused the incoming electrons to release energy quanta, decaying into both matter and antimatter. The rate and density at which positrons were detected surpassed previously recorded levels in a laboratory. 
In the mid-1960s, at Kern's Proton Synchrotron and the Alternating Gradient Synchrotron at Brookhaven National Laboratory in America, researchers including Antonino Zicicci were able to spot nuclei of antideuterium. It was in 1995 that Cairn announced its achievement of having created nine anti-hydrogen atoms. This scientific breakthrough was made possible by employing the slack Fermilab concept during the EPS-210 experiment with the low-energy antiproton ring, Lear, and under the leadership of scientists Walter Olert and Mario Macri, these initial anti-hydrogen atoms were immensely high, energy and consequently difficult to analyze. To overcome the setback, two collaborations, Athena and ATRAP, were formed in the late 1990s to better delve into anti-hydrogen studies. In a significant stride forward, Kern introduced the antiproton decelerator in 1999, a device that could reduce antiproton speed from 35 GeV to 5.3 MeV. The purpose, though not yet fully realized, was to cool antihydrogen to manageable levels for research. By late 2002, the Athena project, closely followed by ATRAP, publicized that they had generated the world's first cold antihydrogen. Antiprotons used in these experiments were slowed down with the antiproton decelerator, filtered through a tinfoil sheet then gathered in a pinning Momberg trap even though the method was operational. It was not very efficient. Out of the 25 million antiprotons exiting the decelerator, only about 25,000 made it to the trap, a tiny fraction of the original count. Despite the achieved deceleration, antiprotons were still hot when caught. To further cool them, they were immersed in an electron plasma where they cooled through cyclotron radiation and Coulomb collision. To form anti-hydrogen, positrons from radioactive sodium were then collected in a circo-style positron accumulator and united with the antiprotons. Due to their neutral state, the resultant anti-hydrogen atoms were not affected by the trap's electric and magnetic fields, freeing them to collide with the trap walls and annihilate just microseconds later. Hundreds of millions of anti-hydrogen atoms have been produced in this manner, advancing the study into this crucial particular side of particle physics. In the fertile field of cutting-edge scientific research, anti-hydrogen, a form of neutral antimatter, has witnessed fascinating advancement. In 2010, the trailblazers at the Alpha Collaboration famously unveiled their revolutionary achievement. The unprecedented trapping of neutral antimatter, specifically 38 anti-hydrogen atoms for approximately one-sixth of a second. Expanding upon this breakthrough by April of the following year, Alpha reported that they had successfully confined 309 anti-hydrogen atoms for a remarkable duration of 17 minutes, setting a record for the time that neutral antimatter had ever been held captive. These accomplishments opened up new frontiers, providing scientists the opportunity to explore the spectral attributes of anti-hydrogen. The unveiling of ELENA, extra low-energy antiproton decelerator. In 2016, an innovative antiproton decelerator and cooler further advance these studies, Elena, through vigorous acceleration of particles, is able to cool antiprotrons down to 90 kV, considered cool, enough for further examination. However, the creation of antimatter still suffers hurdles, most notably the pervasive scarcity of antiprotons. Kern has contributed to overcoming this challenge by developing facilities capable of producing a staggering 10 million antiprotrons per minute. The colossal time frames involved unfortunately persist as a roadblock, with estimates that the production of a mere gram of antihydrogen under the most optimistic scenarios would demand a span of 100 billion years. Antihelium. Three nuclei, artificially generated anti-alpha particles, were also observed in the scientific community. The successful creation and detection of antihelium. Three in antihelium. Three in antihelium. Three are monumental achievements in the realm of modern particle physics. However, storing antimatter remains an exceptionally challenging feat. Direct interaction between antimatter and matter triggers a spontaneous annihilation process, undermining attempts to store antimatter in conventional matter receptacles. The pinning trap, leveraging a blend of electric and magnetic fields, offers one effective solution, enabling the containment of antimatter in the state of charged particles. Through these scientific feats and progressions, the world of antimatter continues to both baffle and enthrall researchers worldwide. Yet every breakthrough, no matter how minor, like that of Cairn's ability to preserve antihydrogen for 17 minutes in 2011, allows for further exploration and understanding of this fascinating realm of scientific discovery.
The exploration of antimatter's astounding potential in various fields is both fascinating and costly. Generating antimatter is a process that requires substantial financial investment due to the difficulties involved in its intricate production. In the past, estimates have suggested a staggering $625 trillion per gram of antihydrogen, making antimatter production one of the most expensive endeavors in science. Notably, Cairn has invested hundreds of millions of Swiss francs for the production of a minuscule amount of antimatter, about one billionth of a gram. Consider that the Manhattan Project, responsible for producing the first atomic weapon, cost an adjusted $23 billion in 2007 terms, and the economic magnitude of antimatter research is put into perspective. Current studies are looking into changing this cost. Flow dynamic by collecting naturally occurring antimatter from Earth's Van Allen belt and the gas giant planet's belts using magnetic scoops. Antimatter isn't merely expensive. Its potential applications make it valuable. It plays a vital role in medical fields, such as in positron emission tomography, PET. Additionally, laboratory experiments have indicated the possibility of using antiprotons in cancer treatment methods, mirroring techniques in ion therapy. In the realm of space travel, stored antimatter could serve as an incredible source of fuel for interplanetary or interstellar journeys. Being part of an antimatter, catalyzed nuclear pulse propulsion, or an antimatter rocket system, antimatter's exceptional energy density provides a significantly greater thrust to weight ratio for spacecraft compared to that offered by conventional fuel. A collision between matter and antimatter releases colossal amounts of energy, vastly surpassing both nuclear fission and fusion reactions. However, current technology isn't sufficiently advanced to harness all this potential energy due to the inherently complex nature of the annihilation product. Additionally, high-energy photons resulting from these collisions pose their own challenge. Being hard to direct and utilize for thrust despite these challenges, the harnessing and utilization of antimatter could revolutionize various fields. During the Cold War, the U.S. Air Force explored the potential of antimatter, not only as a trigger for nuclear weapons, but as the explosive material itself. While the concept of using antimatter has been entertained, its practicability has always been hindered by the challenges associated with its large-scale production despite these constraints. It's also important to note that there exists no evidence supporting its viability as a weapon component. Research into the physics of antimatter, funded by the military, underscores the persistent intrigue around its possible applications in warfare.